guess the short way to describe it is it is it's trying to describe that point where point between where memory becomes history. Or that's something. It's like those sort of things that you kind of you can't quite remember dreams, you know. Then and then you make that decision as to whether you're going to uh, commit that to memory, kind of like write it down or <clears throat> or whatever, or or whether it just sort of it just disappears. Um, <clears throat> this is something that we've, we've just done recently. It's, <coughs> excuse me. It's, it's 21 years since we first started working with um, Orteca, uh, a band signed to Warp Records, which we've had a, a close working relationship with for you know, 21 years. Um, and, and this particular piece is a th this is a, a, a print that we did, a limited edition print that we did that uh, that we sell. But it, it's our version of, sort of, a, of some creative that we did for Orteca's uh, planned live events this year. And I think that actually they, only, that they ended up, they only did uh, the big warp thing in, in, in Krakow um, last week. Um, Warp's a record label, by the way, it wasn't Sheffield. Uh, anyway, uh, so the idea behind this was. Um, we wanted to do something that wasn't that didn't relate to any of the previous albums because when they play live, it's kind of improvised anyway, and it didn't necessarily link to any future album artwork um, that we would do because they haven't recorded an album. So it was a standalone piece, and 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 we wanted something that kind of was still futuristic or of the future rather than futuristic, um, but also represented sort of the past. So it's like the, it's like the future from the perspective of the past because it's celebrating 21 years of working together. Um, so we 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 start our starting point was um, uh, uh, Franco um, my, my Italian's appalling but it's Franco Grignani um, who I think in 1965-66 uh, designed this kind of proto computer uh, font um, for Italian design yearly or yearbook or something um, I mean, really liked it because it's, 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 it's the past representing the future um, so that was it really and then, and then it's also it's kind of glitched because that sort of, you know, kind of it relates to Vortex's uh, live performance Aphex Twin I don't know if any of you have heard of Aphex Twin? Um, <laughs> uh, my, my, la the last two weeks, if you ask me kind of what do I do in my life, the last two weeks has basically been talking about this album cover, um, doing interviews with all sorts of like, from graphic magazines, New York Times, everybody wants to talk about um, Aphex Twin. Um, so consequently, I don't really. Um, the, for those, for those of you that don't know, the point of this record cover, um, it's about it's about disinformation, and and Richard uh, Aphex Twin, Richard James, and I get on fairly well because we have a really similar view um, to this whole thing of, of uh, the music industry and, uh, and it being about and it becoming it becomes to be about the product and not the music. Um, so. The point of this album is that if you if you read the incredibly long list of of costs, which is basically this, and so uh, there's a there's an image on, on my uh, on our Facebook or, or Design Republic Facebook, which you can please like, um, but uh, but I'm, I'm I'm basically holding it out like this, and that's that's the length of the list at seven point time. It's it's ridiculously long. Deliberately, and it's every single cost that that goes into make, making and promoting the product as opposed to the album. So there are costs like uh, the cost of the sandwiches that were that were provided at a listening thing for journalists, or the cost of a cab taking the master, you know, uh, tapes or whatever to being to the pressing plant or, or whatever they do. Uh, and every cost is 
it, it, so let's say that, let's say you buy the CD and it costs uh, ten euros, then all of the costs would add up to ten euros. So you get them as a, as a fraction of the cost. So you can pick up your CD and you go like, oh, part of my ten euros for, for buying this CD was 0 0.00003 cents on coffees at the recording session or something like that. So the idea is really to, to demystify and expose uh, exactly the, the process of making and promoting the product of an album. Um, but obviously, so it's a kind of how to make an album, if you like, except that it isn't, because if you want to, there's like 300 different costs. So if you want to sort of, okay, I'm going to make an album. Now the first thing I've got to do is spend this much on sandwiches. <laughs> Um, and then this this here is uh, he also we were we were laughing about the fact that um, that sort of you know in the rock uh, uh, area of, of music you know it's like so and so plays Fender guitars or so and so uses such and such amps so what we decided to do was to list every single piece of equipment that he used in making the album. So obviously he's been making electronic music for a long time and he's, and, and he's got loads of gadgets and plugins and gizmos. So every single thing that he used in making the album is listed um, in a circle. And then the, the dots, you know, you, if you can follow around where the dots are, you can work out what is, um, exactly what he's done. But the, but the point is, is that you could buy all that equipment but you still couldn't necessarily make the album. So again, it's this thing that kind of, it's saying, this is how I've done it, but by, by overloading um, the information, it, it's a question of the more you know, the less you know. Um, and the design is, in, is, is really intended to be, it's not non-design, it's not, it's not, it hasn't been designed, but it's, it's undesigned. Um, so it's a, very, it's a very sort of simple, neutral, um, looking font and it's literally just the list and so and because I wanted the list to to not be in columns but to be one long list it meant that you had to have like triple gatefold vinyl but there's nothing on the inside there's nothing anywhere else it's just this list and so essentially the, the, pro, the process was was aimed to get to a point where um, Really, the, 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 the design is really talking only about the product and not the music. Oh, there's also, in the limited edition, which, you know, um, is very limited, but there's, um, we had this idea of, of he, he had this, he had this extra track and, and, and walked with the record label saying, let's make this a bonus track, let's do something that, that people would want to buy. Um, and we had this idea based on old, we were, we were talking about when we were kids, we used to get those uh, Christmas cards that were little flexi discs that you could actually put on your turntable and play. So we we started off by saying, well, well couldn't we make the, the record cover something you could play? And that turned out to be impractical financially and logistically. So then it kind of it evolved into the idea that there would be um, a limited a limited edition print that you would get with the album, but the, but the print would have the bonus track stamped into um, the, the card, into the stock. So, and it is, and it's done, it's, it's, you, if, you could, if you could put a piece of cardboard on a turntable and play it, it is actually the track. They went down the whole route of pressing, of, of, of cutting the track and getting it ready. So if you press that into vinyl, it would play, but it's not, it's pressed into into cardboard, into stuff that you get on record covers. So you can't play it, so you can never hear the bonus track, but it is there. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure I'm going to get through the whole alphabet, but anyway. B is for buy me. Um, in 2002, on January the, uh, February the 14th, uh, my birthday, um, we launched um, our merchandising site online. Uh, and it, it was called, it, well, it is still called the People's Bureau for Consumer Information. Um, and really, it, what it was, it, it, one of the one of the things that's uh, 
things that inspire us or, or uh, influence what we do or, the, or our, our interests are things that, whether it be consumerism or religion or anything like that, things that, that people have to have an element of faith in. And why, why, why do we believe certain things? Um, so the thing about the consumerism thing is, is, is that a lot of our work has, 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 has been about sort of celebrating barcodes as, uh, as symbols of consumerism, etc. Um, and then at the same time, we were, did, we were designing a lot of t-shirts for, for the bands that we were working with, like at the time, like Pop Root itself, uh, or The Orb, or, or bands um, on Warp Records, um, R&S, whatever. Um, and a lot of those bands ended up selling more t-shirts than records. So then people would come to us and say, why don't you do Designers Republic t-shirts on a regular basis rather than just sort of to celebrate certain events? So we decided to, to sort of see if we could, we could join in the consumerist game. So one of the ideas is that the consumerism uh, is a game and that uh, and it's a, it's, a, it's a kind of a battle between advertisers and, and marketing people and the audience to, to, to keep to maintain a sort of a stimulation to to buy things or, or to sort of to they try it basically and, and we do this when we work with Coca-Cola I mean we're, we're just as guilty of, of doing this but the idea really is to is to convince you that you really need something that you didn't even know you wanted in the first place. So we opened we opened this store online, and then we, we also then opened a store in Tokyo um, because that seemed to be like you know, the most consumer thing that we could do. So these are the the, the 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 sort of container carrier planes and the vans and the helicopters that are, that are coming out from the consumer uh, people's bureau every day just to deliver goods for people like you. C is for a lot of things, but I'm not going to do that. But C is for Coca-Cola. Um, uh, <laughs> 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 well, the thing about Coca-Cola is uh, we were approached by by Coca-Cola a few times prior to this to do to just do campaigns um, and. We, we didn't do it because it didn't seem to be any, any point, really, apart from the money. And maybe, seeing as my old company went bust in 2009, maybe we should have just took the money. But um, but this was kind of an, an interesting project, and we were approached directly uh, by Coca-Cola to the Global in Atlanta, and it wasn't just a campaign. What the, the idea was, what they wanted to do um, was try to uh, reconnect with their pop cultural past. So, in, so like you know, in the, in the 60s, when Warhol wanted to um, create images that referenced pop culture, one of the first things that he did was a Coca-Cola bottle. That was what was seen to represent youth culture at the time. The problem that, that Coca-Cola have now is that you know it might be it's more likely to be Nike or or Red Bull or Apple. Those are the things that you would define youth culture with in some ways, in terms of products. Um, uh, and and Coca-Cola being sort of a sugary, fizzy drink isn't sort of really high on the list of cool things for, for people uh, now. So this project was, was, was an attempt to, even not necessarily for Coca-Cola to become you know, sort of market leaders in the cool uh, states again, but at least to re-engage um, with with popular culture um, after sort of several you know around sort of ten or fifteen years of just being full on just market market marketing and selling so, um, and so it was the M5 project and it's very much a design led project and we were allowed to do what we did what we wanted to do uh, and it seemed like an interesting thing to do really irrespective of the uh, of, of the brand and actually it was it was it was pretty good there was a lot of because Coca Cola is such a uh, big um, global corporation, um, it's it's kind of beneficial for their public image to to invest a fair amount of money in social causes uh, or social things. Um, they put a lot of money into um, the rescue after 
uh, the tsunami in Thailand and things like that. So we kind of thought, well, you know, if we can, if we can be part of that, pushing them to do more of that um, through this project, then that's a good thing. So that that was it. It's basically the idea of love being. And, and it, uh, so we did loads of these. We did a lot of work on these uh, alley bottles, and these alley bottles were supposed to be um, were supposed to replace cans um, because they might be me. Anyway, um, so what they worked out is one of the most rec recognisable. Uh, images of Coca-Cola globally is the, sh is the shape of the Coca-Cola bottle and obviously anybody can have a, a, a can so they wanted to try and develop a, a, a bottle that was a can or a can that was a bottle and um, so we did a lot of work on that and, and redesigned a whole load of packaging for them beyond these special uh, limited editions um, but it, it kind of it kind of stalled because they got a whole load of stuff made to kind of go out um, uh, you know product they got a whole lot of products made and they kind of got it and they stacked them up on pallets and ready to ship out and then the next day they came and, and half of the pallets at the bottom were crushed because the one thing that they couldn't do was to get the, the tensile strength of the bottle to be strong enough to not be crushed so in some ways it's, it was a nice idea but defeated by gravity um, <laughs> which has been my problem for a long time. Uh, this was part of, um, this is, uh, C is for consumer fascism, and it was part of, a, we, we used to do uh, a new exhibition every year based on every Christmas there's a, a bar like this in Sheffield called The Forum, and we'd have an exhibition there. So for about four or five years, we'd do it every Christmas. Um, and this one was called, uh, this exhibition was called DR Mart, and it was it was like M dash art, so it's like um, it, it's the idea of of art being for sale, and that people people like Damien Hurst, um, whom my missus used to work for, but but he when he's making his art, he's very aware of, of the marketplace. Um, so it's not like someone you know sort of just making a piece of art and then oh someone bought it. It's actually sort of it's almost designed art uh, for the consumer market. Um, this this isn't really about about him. This was just this was just there was, there was like twelve pieces, I think, in, in each exhibition. So really, this one is just is just playing on the idea of uh, that consumer fascism, where you know, people look and if you're not wearing the right label or you're not eating the right food or you don't go to the right bar, and people you know. People make value judgments on your consumer decisions, so it's really about that. And we just used the idea of uh, you know, potent imagery for, for consumer fascism, for like Nuremberg rallies, when we're just taking the swastika out and putting in um, barcodes and stuff like that. Uh, D is for uh, department stores around new cathedrals. I'm showing this really that there's, there's not so much to say about this. This is just an example of a, of a lot of the work that we did um, around this time, which is around sort of, the, sort of 95 to 2000. And, and really, it's not about the subject matter. That I'm, I'm showing this because it's about, we got into this whole thing of, of overlaying and multi-layering stuff. And that I, that's an idea based on um, the concept that there, <clears throat> there is no one truth, and truth is dependent on perspective. Uh, there was a, there's a really great uh, TV ad, I think it was for the Guardian newspaper um, in the UK, sort of in the, in the 70s or early 80s. And the first shot is you see a, a sort of a, a, an upright, sort of a, a good citizen, like a businessman walking along you know, with his briefcase, and, you know, sort of, and he represents sort of you know, a law abiding and everything like that. And what you see in this hand is like a, a sort of a you know Nazi thug skinhead, you know, sort of, with all this sort of gear, kind of running up and then just jumping on him. So the point is, is if that was where that was your perspective, you would say that the skinhead was attacking a totally innocent bloke walking down the street. But then they show you the same thing taken from further back and a wider perspective. And what you actually see is that the, the businessman. Uh, is walking along past uh, a building site and there's a huge rock 
falling down. So the guy actually who pushes him to the ground is, is knocking him away and saving his life, effectively. But if you only saw it from a per first perspective and you were in court and you said, you were asked what you saw, you'd have to say that. So the point is, is that if you, the further you stand back, you know, the more you see. So truth, the truth is, 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 is dependent on perspective. And so what we used to do was rather than just uh, distilling a lot of ideas down into one idea for, the, for a piece of artwork, we got into the habit of, of kind of putting every idea that we had on different layers. So you know, that, that's basically something that, that working with uh, computer software like freehand for Illustrator, I suppose. But anyway, um, one, one is good and the other one is Illustrator. Um, so we, we would just multi-layer everything and then kind of to try and get a sense of, of, of truth, we kind of cut away at certain layers. So effectively, when you're looking at this and you're looking through, the idea is, is actually kind of you're, you're looking down into sort of, into like geological strata or something. Um, I, I can do two hours just on that if you want. But, uh, uh, D is also for destroying minimalism. Um, it's from 2002. There's a magazine in Norway called Hot Rod, um, which I was disappointed to find out was about design. Um, uh, and they and, and they basically seen the emigre, an issue of Emigre magazine that was devoted to design as public, and they wanted to do um, a similar thing, but obviously from a different perspective. Um, and so we decided to do, uh, the magazine was Designers Republic Unplugged. And so it was all basically original little doodles and sketches from sketchbooks, not scanned and redrawn uh, in vectors, um, but just the original sort of stuff. So this, is, this was just one of them that, that was really, um, uh, I mean, it, it, there's a whole story behind that, but we'll move on. But, but it was just one of those uh, little sort of sketches that we then put on t-shirts and people seem to like it. It's based on the idea that, you know, when people say uh, less is more, that's absolute bollocks because it's not less is less, because less means less. Uh, more is more, but that's okay. It doesn't, doesn't matter, less can be, that's fine. Just don't put so much in it, it can be minimal. But this whole idea of like, and it, and it was really a reaction to, uh, in the UK, you know, it is, there's, there's a sort of sense that kind of, uh, the kind of covers that, uh, I, I know Mark Farrow, and he's a good, you know, good bloke, but, but kind of he would win loads of awards basically because he'd kind of have do a Pet Shop Boys cover that's really small with a tiny image and some really nice sort of small considered type. They said, you know, this is very sort of cultured and you know, whatever. Um, and our stuff was kind of referred to as being like go faster stripes and like maximalism and not really sort of very sort of cultured because we didn't, you know, it's a bit like furniture, you know, that's an old modernist sort of furniture thing. So really this was just to do with destroy minimalism, put it in a shopping trolley set fire to it. Um, this one's really only here because I think it's one of the, it's funny. Um, my friend, my friend Steve Cobby has a band called, or did have a band called Fila Brasilia, trip hoppy kind of stuff from that time. Um, and uh, and they, we were doing the cover and it was his 10th album. And so he said, okay, well, you know, I'm going to call, I want to call it something simpler. So he wanted to call it Dies, as in 10, French for 10, as you know. Um, so we were there and they were just, and he lives in Hull, and you know, there's a lot of really sort of working class people in Hull that don't give a shit about the niceties of design. It's because I wanted to put a poster, I wanted to design a poster that would go all around the cities of the UK and in record shops and say, Dick's out now. <laughs> I'm very proud of that. <laughs> Uh, D is also for Docfest. Docfest is a, an international documentary film festival um, in Sheffield. Um, they used to, their branding used to be, uh, and this was really good, uh, the international film, the international documentary film festival in Sheffield. So kind of, you know, that's not particularly exciting. And what they wanted to do was, it's, it's really a, a kind of a, a business thing for documentary filmmakers to get funding or people to come and source uh, underground films. 
But to get some cash uh, from various different sponsors, they had to make it more public facing, actually make it a real film festival. The problem is in Sheffield is that, is that we're simple folk and we kind of think that why would you go to the cinema to see a documentary? You see those on TV, they're kind of pretty dull. If you want to go to the cinema, you want some special effects and lots of blood and spaceships and, and all that kind of thing, you know. Or at least, you know, kind of James Bond or something. You don't really want to go and see a film, you know, about a small tribe in Central Africa that, you know, whatever they do. But anyway, so our job was to try and make it more interesting. So we have this whole thing about the truth, the, the truth is out there and the truth is stranger than fiction. Um, and based on that, we, we wanted to do sort of something, so I'm not sure why, I think it was just we thought it was a good idea at the time, but we had this horse's head, kind of this you know, mouldy rubber horse's head in the office for some reason, we don't need to go into that, but anyway, <laughs> we, so what we did, we also, um, a friend of ours, for some reason, had one of those like, little electric kind of buggies that old people go around on, you know, sort of mobility kind of buggy. So we, we basically got this, an, another guy that we knew, um, dressed up in a, with normal clothing with a horse's head on, and then we just filmed him, him sort of driving around Sheffield, you know, kind of going in multi-storey car parks, and we even sort of filmed him like going to sort of pretend to fill the car up at a petrol station, and then just also kind of documented people's reactions to that. So the idea that kind of it, it was truth is stranger than fiction, really. But the reason that we, that we like use this image was that it's it's the same pose as, as Clint Eastwood in Dirty Harry. So we just kind of quite like the idea because we kept saying, you know, you need to make you know documentary films appear more accessible or interesting to ordinary cinema goers. So we just you know made it look like Dirty Harry. Uh, the horse's head. Anyway, uh, D is also for DR Angry Man. This is our logo. Um, it, we just got a model made, really, for for an exhibition, and um, its eyes flash on and off. Really exciting. Um, D is also for uh, Doctor No B, which was um, the sort of first and only font that I designed that was made commercially available. Um, I, I'm, I'm always, I'm always, uh, I'm always sad when, when I, I do quite a bit of teaching, especially at Manchester School of Art, but you know, quite a bit of teaching, and you get sort of young kids that that have like done some shit font in, in, in you know, some like software, whatever they're using. And, and then they, they put on their, because they have to design their own business cards when they're leaving. They put, you know, sort of so and so, you know, like designer and typographer. And you kind of think, no, just because that's not typography, you know, that's. But anyway, uh, so, I, so I don't, I'm not really into publishing our fonts, particularly because we only ever draw them um, for specific purposes. And sometimes we use them after that, but they're never sort of designed to be used you know, just by anybody, because they're kind of hand-drawn and you have to hand curl them and whatever. So they're, they're really, uh, and, 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 and the idea of like Dr. No B was that it was basically a series of designs that looked like letter forms. Um, and it was monospace because I couldn't work out the kerning, and, and, and more importantly, I couldn't be asked to work out the kerning. Um, because that's not really what I, what I do. Um, Anyway, that's Dr. No B. E is for Echo City. Uh, Echo, in 2000, uh, 2006, it says it on there. Uh, 2006, um, I, I was asked to be one of the co curators for the British Pavilion at the Venice Biennale of Architecture. Um, I don't know why, but it was for a free lunch, so I did it. Um, what were, that, the, the theme of that year's Biennale was, was cities and, and what, what the British Council did in, was rather than having it about London, they decided to ask for proposals from different people around the country about different cities um, and, and we won. Yay. Um, and, and, and Echo City, the, the, the story behind the Echo City is uh, it's, it's based on the idea that kind of the, what we 
what we traditionally know as a city, so Timisoara or whatever, is a very physical thing. But actually now, thanks to one example, is thanks to the internet, the, the people that we live with, if you like, could be all over the world, and it's based on common interest or shared interest. And there's lots of different ways that you can group people together. So is a city really just the, the structure, or is a city the community? And, and we had this idea, oh, one of the things that I've been working on was this idea that there's as many different Sheffields as there are people who live in Sheffield, and, in, and there's as many different Timishwaras as there are people living here. All of you have a different mental map of the space that you occupy, based on your interests or your daily routine, um, or your aspirations, your history, uh, where you were brought up, everything. And there's also as many different Timishwaras as, as, as there are people who've read about it, or, or, or for me, I, I've visited. So I've, I've been here just under a day. So. If somebody asked me to describe this city, all I could do would just describe the places where I've been. Um, but that would be a valid description for me, but it's not the same as yours. So, the Echo City is actually something uh, that represents that unintentionally. During the war, um, Sheffield is, uh, was, uh, before the witch Thatcher, destroyed it, but um, Sheffield was uh, a coal mining and steel manufacturing city, very working class, but, but based on manufacture. Um, and during the war, um, when sort of making stuff out of metal was important, um, then Sheffield was a very important city. So obviously there was the idea of like blackouts so that the bombers couldn't see. But if you've got like a huge steel factory where there's huge furnaces, you can't close the door when the furnaces are on because it gets so hot in there everything's just going to completely spontaneously combust so they have to leave the doors open so there's no way that they could avoid that so some students at the architecture school in, in Sheffield had this idea that, that basically a city from, from the sky at night is really just a series of lights so if you fly into a city into an airport at night you just see it as a kind of really nice graphic kind of structure of, of light, so you can't see anything else. So they decided to try to replicate the city of Sheffield uh, in the countryside just by lights, and uh, so they'd have like the big sort of like floodlights, and they'd have f fires and things. And then like kind of you fly over, and then you see another thing like oh, got in Himmel or whatever, whatever they whatever they say, and shells, and they get picked up, whatever you know. But. Um, but the problem was, was, even if they thought the Echo City was the city, they'd already dropped their bombs on the first thing that they saw. So it was a great idea, um, didn't really work. A little bit like Sheffield Wednesday's tactic. Uh, e is also for Emigre magazine, um, a California-based magazine. I, I, I don't think it's still going. But, but anyway, um, Rudy van der Land sent me uh, a fax no, it's only a fact, fact, very modern. And he said he'd like to do um, an issue about the Sunnish Republic because he thought um, that we were the, uh, the natural successors to Wolfgang Weingart. Now, bear in mind that I never studied design. You know, at, at college, I did philosophy. Um, he, so he said, hey, you're the natural successors to Wolfgang Weingart, so I had to go and like, look up. Wolfgang Weingart was, and, uh, and I was still none the clearer because I didn't really sort of get why I said that. But anyway, it seemed to kind of, you know, uh, tickle his fancy, so yeah, okay, fine. Um, so we just did a whole, it's a whole issue, you can try and find it online somewhere or, or whatever. Um, the cover was the, one of our, one of our, uh, our mascot, if you like, is, is Sissy, um, and um, and this is where she was born, the cover of Emigre, because Rudy said, I want you to do, I like, quite like a lot of your political comment, could you do um, a, a political comment on, on America, as you see it from the Science Republic's perspective in a northern British city. You know, so he said, don't you know, just do what you think. It doesn't have to be uh, it, so subjective, not objective. Uh, and at the time, 
uh, America was doing a lot of attacking small countries in the name of freedom and democracy. Um, so obviously that could place it at any point in history really. But it, I think it was around, it must have been, it's, it was 93-94, so it's probably one of the Gulf Wars. But anyway, the, the idea was that, that, that Sissy um, represented American foreign policy. So she's cute and very friendly and hey, you know, have a nice day y'all and, and all that. But actually she's got a baseball bat behind her back. Um, so like if you don't have a nice day y'all in an American way, well, Get shit out of yours. Um, and that's where she was born. Uh, e is also for EXD, which is um, which is the Lisbon Biennale. Uh, it's based around design thinking. <clears throat> and from 2009 to 2013, I was the creative director for Comms. Um, before we got involved, they, they had this was a similar thing to the documentary film festival. Before I was involved, they had some really nice sort of printed material, collateral, promotional material, uh, messaging. But it was all kind of clever, clever, sort of smart. So it might appeal to people like us in this room, but to the people in, you know, just getting their daily shopping or something out in the rest of the city, it'd be a bit like um, And not because those people are, are stupid, it's just like, it doesn't engage with them, it doesn't make them want to find out more. So we just did a whole, so the first campaign was, it was originally it was called It's All It's About Time, which is you know, very clever, you know, it's about time, we talked about this stuff, but it's also the subject matter is It's About Time. Um, and we just, you know, the, it, 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 they said we need more of a wow factor, so we just did this whole campaign, it was New Now Wow, uh, and we, we basically covered the city of, of Lisbon in these things that New Now Wow, and all that. Um, and it, and it really changed people's perceptions and actually engaged the public for them to think that this seemed like an, an exciting thing to go to some of these talks. Um, I mean, in fact, they found out when they got there that it wasn't. It was just people like me talking. Um, but anyway, but at least you know, we did our bit. F is for Fleshburger. This was for an exhibition called Customized Terror um, in New York in America. Uh, in uh, artist space in Soho, and it was curated by a guy from Yale University called Ronald Jones, um, and he, he liked the idea that we were playing around with consumerism, and uh, so we did a whole series of these things. There's like uh, 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 we did a lot. It's all about, about sort of consume, consumerism and different things. So there's like consumerism and religion. So we did one about. Uh, with Jesus, like, like that, saying, beware the voice of the prophet, but prophet as in money rather than the prophet. And it was really just talking about, you know, not about people's faith, but about the church as an organisation and, and you know, turning over a prophet and owning land and, 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 and uh, things like this. And this one was really just saying, you know, there's nothing wrong with eating burgers, but it's, don't call it burger, or, or like, you know, kind of all these different names for sort of cuts of meat, it's, it's flesh, that's what you're eating. And if you're okay with that, that's fine. Not, we're not making a, a stand for vegetarianism, God forbid. But, um, but it was just this, the idea is it's just, you know, kind of calling a spade a spade or whatever. So this idea is like, you know, uh, flesh is pure holy cow. Um, you know, and at, and at the bottom it's really just all the, it's, it's kind of what you really should be saying on a Burger King thing, you know, it's, uh, 100% juicy dead animal pumped up with mouth-watering additives, fillers and preservatives. <laughs> Tasty. Um, um, this was just, this is F is for Fluke, a band that we got to know through the Wipeout uh, games. They did a sort of, lot of stuff on the soundtrack and then we started working with them. And this was just, uh, and I'm really just showing this because people often think that really our stuff is very graphic. But a lot of what we do as well is, is, is art direction. So this is just a, a coffee machine, but you know it kind of looks like a robot or something. So we did a whole thing. They had an album called Risotto. Um, I don't know why they called it Risotto. I thought it was a shit title, really. Um, but but we, we, we had like loads of real sort of uh, fetishistic kind of images of, of high-end food processors and things. You know, photographed as if they're kind of models like a fashion shoot, 
Um, and this was just one that we did for a, 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 one of the singles that came off the album. So there's lots of sort of, you know, shiny kitchenware um, shot in a kind of... It was around the time that we did some stuff with uh, some friends who actually had a fetish clothing company, so we were kind of in that mode. Um, F is also for freehand. Is anybody here old enough to have used freehand? Chosen ones. Okay. Uh, free, people ask us quite often, ask us, how do you do that? I'm trying to do that in Illustrator. How, do you, how did you do that and how did you do that? The answer is we didn't do that in, in Illustrator. We've done it in freehand. And freehand was, at the time, significantly better to do the kind of stuff that we did. You couldn't do it in Illustrator, it just didn't have the functions. Um, so obviously we're you know, still pissed off that uh, it was bought by Adobe and, and killed. Um, and it's a little bit like, the analogy really is if you haven't used freehand, I mean, and if you've got used to Illustrator now, it doesn't really matter, but the analogy really is, is uh, Apple, Mac, and, you know, and then sort of Microsoft. That, that every, most people use at the time before iPhones and things. Most people use Microsoft and PCs, but that didn't mean it was better than a Mac. It just had better marketing, better business behind it. Um, anyway, <coughs> sermon over about freehand. Um, F is also for Funkstrom. Um, this is a, a, a band from Munich, uh, near Munich, and. And the reason I'm showing this is it's not because I've just been there on the way here. Um, it's we, we did an album cover that was all about treating again. It's as similar to the Apex Twin thing, treating a band as a product or as a brand. So this is a style guide for how to use the Funkstrom brand. G is for, I see that from, G is for <laughs> Gatecrasher. It's a disco. Do you know Gate? Do you know Gatecrasher? Okay, it's a, it's a bit, basically it was, a, it was the trance club in the UK for, for a while. Um, it's in Sheffield um, and they need an image. So <coughs> we effectively defined, I intentionally designed, defined how trance looked by doing the stuff for Gay Crusher. Uh, G is also for Ginza Graphic Gallery where we had uh, our first major Japanese retrospective um, in 2011. So this is really just a shot from, there was two, uh, I guess the gallery was about this, the whole size of this bar, no, a bit more, and then and that on two levels. So <clears throat> if you look at this, it was, you just, we, we built in like kind of walls and pillars and everything so that wherever you looked, you got a, you got a, a very different mix of all the things that were designed as Republic. So <clears throat> if you imagine this is just one view, but imagine it's, you know, the expanse of it. Um, it was. It was. It was more is more. Uh, uh, this is another shot. This is G is for uh, Gulbenkian Musica. We're currently rebranding the Gulbenkian Foundation in Lisbon. Uh, but for the last five years, we've done um, all the stuff for their classical music department, which was a bit weird at first. So I've heard of Beethoven, and then it sort of gets a bit more difficult. Um, but it's an, it's an interesting project in terms of in terms of brand communication and what we what we achieved. And the reason why they asked us to rebrand all of the Goldbinkin Foundation was that we increased uh, brand recognition for the music department uh, and the music season from around five six percent brand recognition when we started, and it's now over eighty five percent in Lisbon, which is pretty high anyway. If you interested in brand recognition statistics, you know, if you are. Anyway, so uh, this is just, this was just, um, we had to do an album cover for Peter and the Wolf, and uh, so I decided to get my son, Sonny, and I'm the Wolf, so it's Peter and the Wolf. It's, it's just, I just like looking at it, because it's my boy, you know. You go and get a drink or something. Uh, H is for the Harlequin Fish Bar, rest in peace. Uh, we had an exhibition, a big exhibition in Sheffield, um, and the, 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 our exhibition launch coincided with the closing of the Harlequin Fish Bar, which was 
basically meant we couldn't have anything to eat anymore. Um, that's uh, one of the guys from Fila Brasilia and one of the guys from Cabri Voltaire did a project called Hey Room. <clears throat> I just like it because well, I, I always wanted to um, to do a pastiche on uh, Simon and Garfunkel's bookends uh, cover because it just seemed, seemed to me to be like a, a really odd kind of image. And then Kruder and Dorfmeister did it. I thought, bastards. And then I just thought, well, you know, no one remembers them anymore. <laughs> so, um, but we want. I, I didn't want to just do it as a straight pastiche. So the idea is that is that both of these guys are kind of around late forties, mid fifties, uh, and uh, and a hay rube in America is is a fight between sort of touring circus people, like in the old Wild West days when you have a tour and they the circus would come into town and inevitably there'd be a scrap between the locals and the, and the circus people, and that was called a hay rube. I, I won't bother you why, but... So the thing was, was I just wanted it to be sort of tears of a clown, there's two miserable old men still making music, you know, grumpy old men making music, sort of like, and having to kind of get their show gear on to make this album and to be pop musicians. I is for... Um, there's a, there's a, a project that we did uh, for a client called Is This Doable? And the original thing was was like one of the one of the downsides to technology was that in the early days was that clients kind of imagined that you could do anything at press of a button. You know, we used to have this sort of joke that, you know, that oh I, I need this doing by tomorrow, can you do it? Because you've got computers now, it's just doable. So we kind of got this whole joke about um, you know, uh, what, well, what we really want for this ad is we'd like to kind of recreate the Big Bang and uh, is that doable? You know, and so there's all this kind of idea that what, what, there was, that there was uh, it's almost like the, the idea that a client's lack of imagination or the client's imagination is, is, is equal to their lack of imagination if you like. So we started doing this thing, is this doable? So this was really just, this was a uh, a three colour screen print that we did um, for a, a, a charity that raises money through selling prints. But it's just based on this idea of like, you know, is this doable? I is for Izzy Mayaki. Um, I can't remember what year this was, but we did a lot of stuff with Izzy Mayaki in Japan for a while. Uh, we, did, uh, we did all the um, uh, invitations for the, for the catwalk shows and the new season of fashion and all that. Kind of stuff, and um, that down there, file that down there. Uh, so, and then basically, what they also did at the time. So, as you like, this was this is 1999. And it was called we called it Year Zero because we we're coming up to 2000. And there's all this, all this talk about um, you know the millennium bugs and all that. And the world was going to come to an end. And all this uh, really exciting stuff. Anyway, so it was just called Year Zero, and what what they would, and is it my hacking at this? Thing called the Oval Project. And the Oval Project was just different designers finding different ways to package and present T-shirts. And what we did, so we, we, we got one so it's vacuum packed as a solid block square, so it's folded and vacuum packed, so it came as a block. And, on, and the design on it just had uh, sort of blank strips where you could fill in your name and what you wanted to say about yourself, which in a, which in a way is, is what most T-shirts do that we wear that have a design on the front. We want to say something about ourselves. We want to have ownership of that idea. So, um, so my, you know, so aim and miss is something that kind of, you know, I'd like to sort of say that, you know, that's something that maybe describes me to other people. Um, you might walk around with like an Iron Maiden T-shirt that sort of says, "I like rock" or something like that. Um, so the idea was that you know that you could define who you wanted to be. So we put a little, so in this package, in this backing pack thing, there was a stencil so that you could stencil. Uh, your details on the show. J is for Jarvis Cocker, uh, Pulp, from Sheffield, friend for sort of since before he was famous and now after he was famous. Um, this, this, I mean, it, this album was basically uh, we talked about an idea for this album cover, and he said, "So I can't really think of anything." And then he said, um, "Mainly what I do now is record the album, and then I go." So I've decided to do Pilates. Uh, so 
I just like the idea that, that, that kind of he was, you know, the Jarvis Cocker contorting himself into odd shapes. But that's kind of quite difficult because he wasn't subtle enough to contort into odd shapes, so we had to kind of fix it. So we did a photo shoot with Rankin, a photographer. And the idea is that, oh, and then Jarvis said, why don't you take pictures of me in a box? And we're like, well, people have done that before. And you should do something a bit different, really, being Jarvis Cocker. So anyway, what we did, we took a whole lot of things of him in, in, in different positions, or sort of Pilates positions, and then we cropped it so that it, you know, so basically you can see where he's cropped down. That's a square of an album cover. So we, we used the crop of the album cover to make it look like he was in, in all positions in the album cover. Uh, J is for Jasmine Gosh. That's it's one of the things we do. Um, that's John Zorn. It's the, that's, there's nothing much to say about that really. It's just that's what we do for the Jazz Festival in Lisbon. K is for Killing Yourself. Um, the idea for this, it was a, a t-shirt that we did for uh, Liberty at yeah, the, the, the Bonsi shop in London. And um, and the, the idea really was, was again, it was, it was this thing we were working on about, uh, funnily enough, about new optimism, but not being cynical. And, and, and the idea of kill yourself um, was not kill yourself, not shoot yourself, but kill yourself and stop being so up your own ass about yourself and it's not all about you. So the idea is kill yourself. And it's, and it's printed backwards so that it reads the right way around when you look in the mirror and love yourself in the morning and that sort of thing where I can, you know, there's that sneaking suspicion you've got that you look fucking great and then, you know, God still got it. <laughs> it's just so that's why it's printed in reverse. You only, ever, you only ever read it the right way around when you're looking in the mirror uh, and thinking about yourself. Crush. Um, this is another one that was, this is from 87, this is another one that was all hand drawn, so literally a huge piece of like uh, graph, paper or graph board, and we just start drawing and colouring in. Except we didn't colour in in those days because you had to send it to repro, but you know, effectively you're not going to. L is for LFO, Sheath. This is another amazing gag. The album's called Sheath. We thought, let's make it look like a Johnny. So, uh, hold on. So it's basically a, a plastic sleeve, but, but uh, there's, there's more to it than that. The, the, the whole design is spread out, is, is see-through, so that the, all the elements are kind of printed on, like part of it's printed on the seat, the disc itself, part of it is on the uh, the jewel case and part of it is on the slip case. So when you, when you, when you pull it apart, it, it, when you pull it apart, it just sort of you know, disappears. Um, M is for, uh, this is kind of ostensibly for Manchester School of Art, um, but it's part of a whole rebranding process that we did for them a few years ago. Um, and the, the problem that the arts, or any art school has really, is, is how do you communicate uh, a message that represents all disciplines. So you can't really put a painting on because it, it, it makes fine art more important than graphic design or architecture or fashion. Da, da, da. And the same applies to, to any kind of image. So we decided to just keep it, bring it right down and then just ask questions of the audience, which is really kind of what my interest in, in design is anyway. The whole idea that, you know, questions. Uh, um, Questions tell you more than answers. Questions are the best answers, or whatever. But really, we, we, we kind of thought that if you distilled everything down uh, about an art school, about the creative process, it's really it. It really is, or definitely should be, ask why. So that was that. Um, this is a. We were talking about this uh, last night. This is a, an album cover from a loco, um, a, a, an English band uh, from Sheffield uh, um, and basically the, the, the loco is in, from the clockwork orange and it, it means milk so we did a lot of stuff that was all just playing around with ideas of, of, of milk or whatever and so the original idea we had for this album cover was um, milk a chocolate and a milk a cow sorry I'll knock, I'll knock that off in a bit so worry so it's about the milk a cow, so it started off about just getting an image of a cow and retouching it so that yeah, the black 
spots were purple. And then we kind of started talking about it and thought, well, why don't we, why don't we go to Switzerland, where the milk, where the chocolate's from, and do a shop there? And, and, and the, the guy who in, in the far side said, yeah, that's a really good idea, that's what we want to, that's what we want to do, because he was really into rock climbing and mountain, mountaineering. You know. He said, I, I'd love to do a photo shoot in front of the Eiger. So we kind of, so the whole process went on, and we, we arranged this photo shoot um, here from Muren, um, in front of the Igo, and I said, right, and so there's a guy, the producer, a guy called Kevin, um, and I said, right, what we want is a black and white cow, and we want to be in the, in the spring meadow uh, in front of the Igo, and the reason we wanted the spring meadow, and we timed it right, uh, was because we all remembered, um, because we're old, we remember this kid's TV programme called Heidi, and at the beginning, the character Heidi is running down the hill through this spring meadow and everything is wonderful in the world. So that was one of the ideas. And then uh, the reason why Rasheen, the singer, is in a uh, suit of armour is because the record label said, that all sounds very nice, but we think that Rasheen should be a bit more glamorous. Um, you know, it, it, it sells, it sells uh, more records. Um, so anyway, we, one of the things that, that, I, that I, I was doing this uh, workshop with people, we were talking about sort of sex and glamour and how that's itself. And one of the images that I used was an image of, I think it's Ingrid Bergman, dressed as Joan of Arc, a very sort of Hollywood Joan of Arc. And, uh, and the, the armour the arm is really nice and shiny and she sort of wants to get makeup on. I don't know where Joan got the makeup at the time. Uh, but anyway, it, it's not really the story of Joan of Arc, it's just, it's just this isn't, it's Hollywood glamour in armour. So, so we said, okay, okay, we'll, we'll make it more glamorous. So then we turned up. So he sourced this armour um, for Rasheen to wear, and then I, I kind of said to Kevin, "Where's the cow?" And he said, oh, it, it, "It's arriving tomorrow morning before the shoot." And I said, what do you mean it's arriving? It's cows? He said, "We well, you don't have black and white cows in this area of Switzerland. You only have brown cows." I said, why didn't you say, he said, well, you, you asked for black and white cows, so I've got you one. And they basically shipped this cow in from the other side of Switzerland, and then up in the, uh, what's it called again? The, how do you get up mountains? In a cable car. So it's the cable car, the, it's the service cable car, so that, 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 that during the winter they kind of get the, the supplies up to this place, it's up the of the mountain. So obviously, you know, when it got there, we go to meet the cow, and it just gives me the evil eye. Like. <laughs> and, and, the, and the cable car is just full of shit and everything, because obviously the cow's not really predisposed to be going up the side of a mountain. So I learned a lot of things about cows that day. One, they don't like going up there. And another one is that cows can't walk backwards. Twat. Uh, so basically, every time the cow is there, we had to move it, if it moved, we had to walk it round in this big circle. So we, we couldn't have the meadow that we wanted because they had late snowfall. The first time I had snow that late in the year for like 150 years. Uh, so we had to go, okay, the, the concept's changed. It's milking a cow in the snow, not on a, on a meadow. And um, so yeah, and so basically we had to put all the snow in back in, in post-production afterwards, because by the time the cow had like walked round and round and round and round, <laughs> it just looked really crap. Uh, yeah, so that's like a triple gate fold, that folds out that image. I, you know, anyway. Uh, uh, Emma's also from Moshi Moshi Sushi. We designed the interior of this Kaiten Sushi, uh, conveyor belt sushi restaurant at Centre Point, that ridiculously pointless big building in London. Uh, is it Centre Point? No, it's not Centre Point. Something like that. Doesn't matter. It's in a really tall, but Canary Wharf is what it is. It's Canary Wharf. But anyway, so the idea was that uh, we created this Tokyo skyline on a huge piece of stretched mm -hmm. canvas. It's about 25 meters long, going around by the edge. Because actually, if you don't have that there, you just look out the window and you, you get it. You, you, it's pretty clear you're not in Tokyo. So you're not going to get a Tokyo experience. So we did this to cover the windows. And the skyline is actually, it's a completely full skyline and it's all made out of images 
of ATM machines and little neons and things. So we completely re you know, built a, a, a pretend skyline. Uh, uh, this is the sourcing. Oh, this, is, this M is for Murray and Vern. Um, we, some friends of ours have got this fetish latex rubber clothing company and uh, the reason I've included it is, is mainly that they said, this is 1998 and they said to us um, you can do whatever you want well, you know, we just want a really good catalogue showing off our images but you can do whatever you want so we just used, we had a little bit of time so if you can find a copy of this catalogue this is just four of the pages as a, as a flat but, it, but it's basically it was it was how to do TDR in 1998. Every trick, all the things that we loved, we just sort of put into into this magazine, uh, uh, book. Uh, N is for networking. Um, it always it always uh, makes me laugh or pisses me off depending on what mood I'm in. That that the really successful agencies. Uh, in the UK, it's nothing to do with talent, skill, vision. It's to do with arse licking and playing golf with clients and, and all that shit. So we just thought that what so we, we needed to do a new uh, promotional image for Designers Republic at the time. So we decided to do it sort of all based on golf. Um, so this is actually on top of a multi-story car park opposite our old office. And, and I mean, I, I made me laugh because the, the people who built the, the car park or whatever had, had decided to make the car, the car parking bays on the top two floors that were visible from the sky, uh, decided to make them green. And when they were asked why, they said, so it looks more like it's grass, so it's not all just concrete, it looks like it's grass. So you've gone up like eight levels in a concrete mass full of like, you know, f uh, sort of petrol guzzling unenvironmentally friendly cars and then you get to the top oh it's, it's like being in the country it's just, I mean, just go there and sit there and picnic on it. so we did that so we thought that would be kind of quite good to have that as the golf course so we rented a whole load of like the most garish golf fair we could or, or bought cheap on ebay you know there is some garish and stuff and um, and then we went and uh, hired this golf buggy um, on the premise that we were going to go and play golf around this golf course about five miles away and, and we just got it and then just drove it off the golf course and then drove it into town and then up there so uh, but it's really just about networking and so really the, the process is one thing but the idea is that is that most of the most of the big money in, in design is actually sort of spent on people that that know how to say yes rather than ask why uh, this was uh, this is uh, a book. This is one of the covers to the book that we've still never done. Um, and again, it's just about the, the multi-layering of images. Um, so that started off being the cover, and then it went on to being like the inside cover of the of the dust jacket. And then another version it ended up being like the first page, and then and now it's just ended up being a slide in a presentation. Uh, and it's also for Nickelodeon. Uh, we were asked to pitch. Um, it's supposed to be really orange. Though. Anyway, we were asked to pitch uh, to rebrand Nickelodeon Europe. Um, and at the time, we thought their brand was all right, really. But the problem was, was they used all their kind of products, like um, all their, their programming, like Sabrina the Teenage Witch, Rugrats, etc., etc., etc. And they just swamped all their branded material with their product which was you know kind of a bit dumb really but anyway so um, we kind of went in and, and really what we wanted to say was you've already got your brand you just need to kind of like wipe the shit off it and and you've got it um, and, and the reason we won the pitch was that I, I couldn't think of a I couldn't think of a a way to describe how to do that that didn't seem to be like some smart ass kind of like well, if you just take all this off, you know, it's a bit like Neville Brody uh, when he, re he when he tried to redesign the Green Pro Greenpeace logo. You know, there's a sort of sense where he's almost sort of saying it looks all right. You don't need to change it. We tried some other ideas, and that's what you've got is the best one. And then they said, no, we we want you to do something different. So 
he did something different. And they said, oh, it's not really, it looks better already. So we didn't want to be in that position. So I just went in and, and instead of doing like a big kind of pitch, big like, yeah, we can do this, blah, blah, blah. I just literally sort of said that we presented this image and just said, what we'll do is a, a Stalinist approach to children's TV branding. And afterwards, when we won it, the, the, the guy said, you know, that that was, that made his year or his career that someone would come in and do a pitch. It wasn't like, this is what we can do for you. Just said, and he says that it was brilliant because you just came in and just said that and nothing else. And we just thought, we've got to go with that, even if it turns out to be really rubbish. You can't pass an opportunity up to do that. The consequence is, is that kind of if you say you're from Sheffield, it's not so bad, pardon me, it's not so bad um, if for Designers Republic now, because you know, we kind of work internationally anyway, but you know, when we started there was always a sense that, oh, oh you're from Sheffield, <laughs> oh, that's marvellous, well done. You know, that's it, that's it, you know. And, and, and in, one, and in one, one, an early interview I did for a magazine called Design Week, this really, this woman with really well meaning. She said, oh, I, you know, she said, I think it's great you're doing design up there in Sheffield. That's amazing. She said, do, where, just tell me, where do you get your design supplies? You know, as if we had to get them shipped in, you know, like on some like wagon, horse-drawn wagon, you know. And um, you know, it's just like we, we just said, sort of oh, well, you know, we kind of get them in the shop, but we can't really use them because we don't have electricity yet. <laughs> um, so there's this whole North South thing. I don't. I, I guess you know, Bucharest, Timișoara, or whatever. I think every country there's there's, there's like kind of um, there's rivalries. And sometimes it's bad because those rivalries actually impact on on what you do, and those attitudes impact on what you do. Uh, so anyway, we had this thing. So but Sheffield is in South Yorkshire. Uh, a uh, county called South Yorkshire, and so we, and, and all the design industry used to be in London. Well, in London used to be based around Soho, so we just said, okay, South Yorkshire is Soho. So we had this whole thing of like we're 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 based in in Soho, and they say, where's that? And we say, oh, it's north of nowhere. <laughs> you know, so so we did all this, and then there's this whole there's also this other big thing about you know kind of about sort of northern strong northern people versus kind of shandy drinking sort of southern. Uh, and um, do you know what shandy is? Shandy, shandy is is what you give kids. It's basically beer or lager, half that and half lemonade. So it's for people that can't take their drink. You know, like, not like hard northern bastards. You know, it's uh, so that whole idea. Of, so the, so this this is a is a print that we've done quite recently um, for a. Another, th another thing called Made North. Um, but anyway, but this, this, this originally was a tiny little sketch in my sketchbook where I was trying to explain to a client from the south why we wouldn't move to the south. And that was a, like, there was a dividing line between the north and the south, and everything below this dividing line is just shandy. And, um, and then basically it kind of got seen a few places and then people kept saying, have you got a print of it? So, so it's now like a, a big you know, A2 print uh, available from our store. Uh, and it's also for NY Sushi, uh, just a club in Sheffield, you know, stuff. O is for Oversteps. Um, this is an album cover uh, that we did for Alltecker. Um, and people often say, what's the favourite thing that you've ever done as, as Designers Republic, or I've ever done as, as, as me? Um, and I don't really have favourites. I don't understand why people are so passionate about making lists and putting things in order. Uh, the, the thing that I value the most is, is, is options. And it, as soon as you start listing favourites, it kind of, to me, it takes away your option that one day I can like this, and another day I can like that. So I like I like the fact that I I like everything that I like, and I like it equally. Um, sometimes and sometimes not. But but even this whole thing, we're saying, you know, what's your favourite record cover? You know, there's fucking thousands of record covers, millions of record covers. Why am I just going to choose one? You know, the idea that kind of just one can satisfy everything that I might want or look for or like in, in a piece of work. But, having said that, 
oversteps is it's not necessarily you know the, my my only favourite, but the thing about oversteps is that it probably is is uh, the, the the one record cover that for me is, is almost the most personal statement about what I do, and and the and the the tension between human and technology, which we have to deal with every day because we're working with laptops and we're working with technology. Um, it, you know, it doesn't spoil my life. I don't wake up in a cold sweat thinking about it. But it's sort of something that you, there's a sort of sense where you kind of have to find a way to make sure that what you're doing isn't just what the software allows you to do, but that you think what you want to do first and then find a way to make the software do that. And if not, then you find a way to make two sets of software do it or whatever. And that's going back to like the, the, the Aphex Twin thing, listing all the all the equipment on that used to make the album. That's the sense that there's a lot of things that we can do. We don't have to uh, limit that to what freehand or Illustrator or Photoshop allows us to do. Anyway, so if you if you reduce all that down to uh, to sort of you know, man versus machine or however you want to you know talk about it, there's that sense that. Quite often, you'll, you'll hear people, their aspiration is to do something as well as a machine can do it, which seems to me to be sort of like the wrong way around. But that's the sense that, you know, trying to do something sort of perfectly, you know, and that, um, and I think well, if we could do that, we wouldn't have machines in the first place. It's, there's, a, there's a phrase in English, kind of, why have a dog and bark yourself? You know, if, if, if I can do all the things that my laptop can do, then I'm I'm not going to waste money on a laptop, you know. I'll just anyway. So the point is, is that one of the things that a machine can do that, in general, humans can't do is draw a perfect circle. So we use that as as, the, as as a representation of the tension between us. So the idea is is that we worked out that on all the different formats um, of the product itself, and so that's the, the covers, the inner sleeves, the labels. Then there's T-shirts promotional posters, how many ads there are going to be. We worked out that there would be 72 different surfaces that are involved in, in, in this design. So what we did was we, we made 72 attempts to draw a perfect circle. And those attempts were done, some of them were done with like big brushes, and some were done with like small brushes, and some were done with pencils, and some of them with felt pens. But what we did so that so literally every single surface of the of the product is an attempt to draw a perfect circle, and the reason why that related so well uh, for me to the Oversteps album was that the Oversteps album was is the most unhuman, not inhuman, most unhuman album that Auto could made so far. It's totally the result of of programming, generating uh, source material from programs, uh, writing their own programs, whereby you. You can change the sound by moving your cursor around the screen and all these things. And then they kind of edit all those things together. So, but the irony was when they played it to me, and I already knew this, they'd already you know, we'd been talking about it, you know, just because that's what we do. But we were talking about them making their album and everything during the process. And then they, then they brought it into the to, to Designers Republic. And they played it and, it, and it was weird because it sounded to me really quite awesome, bits of it that sounded really quite organic. And it sounded a little bit like if you're in a church and someone's playing a church organ. So it, like in the UK, you know, quite often in the UK, the only time you go to church is if someone's getting married. And you kind of sit in there and go and sort of feel a bit awkward and it's a suit that I don't normally wear and, and everything. And then you've got someone just playing nothing on an organ, just this sort of like tootling around you. And it kind of sounded a bit like that. And that's why I thought that the, there was an irony in that how, how, how the genesis of the album was, was purely technological. And the only input that they had was writing the, the programs that generated the sounds, um, and then the editing afterwards. But the sounds, you know, the, the, there, was a, there was that irony that they, uh, it sounded more organic than previous albums. Anyway, so that's why I did that. P is for, uh, is, uh, a really, a really well-known um, 60s brutalist social housing thing. It looks, 
like a huge wall of flat and cemented. And because Sheffield, like Rome, uh, is built on seven hills, it's on built on top of this hill, so it overlooks the whole city. It kind of, I guess, it, if you don't like brutalist architecture, it can look quite oppressive. I just think it looks fucking nice. But um, anyway, it's being it's being sort of regenerated by a company called Urban Splash, and we did a whole load of promotional work. So um, because I because you know I'm running out of time, um, I won't go too much into that. But it's basically an identity that we did um, for Urban Splash because they needed to get the people of Sheffield on side because there's a local election coming up, and one party wanted to regenerate the whole thing. That was so urban splash, that was what they wanted them to win. Uh, the other party wanted to knock it all down and build some more social housing. Um, but anyway, so we have to this whole, there's a whole book of like images and sort of celebrating how beautiful it is. And, uh, P is for uh, Pot Will Eat Itself. Uh, probably worked with Pot Will Eat Itself longer than any other client. Uh, and they've re, you know, relatively, like two or three years ago, they reformed, um, or oh, one of them, anyway. It, but anyway, so this is just, because you, I can't do an A to Z of the uh, Sound Republic without Pop Week itself, and this is um, sort of the, the most recent logo that we've, that we've done for them. Uh, Q is for Q, but well, this is just something we did for MTV Italia. Uh, it was, uh, it was, it was an interesting time because it was um, the very first kind of ideas of, of TV being available on a laptop. Um, they had this thing called Cube and uh, basically you know, when you look at it, by the time we'd done all this work and got done all the promotional stuff and they'd launched it, technology had moved sort of way beyond that and the idea of having TV on the internet was a bit like, yeah, and Whereas when we started the process, it was like, whoa, well, way, you know. Um, so anyway, so this is just we did a whole like bit of identity stuff. Right? Uh, is for, I only put cube in there because I didn't have another cube. Um, R is for return power shift control. This was sort of something that we did as uh, some various sort of t-shirts and various little exhibitions and, and side projects. Um, and then when the Zanzibar Republic went bust in 2009, um, while I was negotiating, getting the rights to use the name and, and, and get, get all the IP back and everything, um, I had to kind of register for, for tax or something. Um, and I couldn't think, you know, it was like, I thought, um, I, I, just, I was just looking at some sort of stuff that we've done as return power shift control, which is obviously kind of quite a political sort of statement based on the, the keys on a keyboard. And uh, I just thought that was quite a, quite a nice idea that, that I was sort of taking control of my own company again, having um, mistakenly trusted it to some shit businessmen. Uh, I can be bitter about that later if you, if you want me to. Okay. <laughs> Uh, S is for Sheffield Design Week. Okay, there was a Design Week in Sheffield. Um, <laughs> uh, S is also for Shop 33. Shop 33 was was a, as an integral part of the People's Bureau for Consumer Information. Um, it's run by a friend of mine, uh, or was run by a friend of mine called uh, Akira Arataki. Um, he he had this shop that sold Design Republic stuff and warp stuff and, and we ended up doing a lot of work with him doing his identity uh, and doing special things and this is basically a series of posters that you've got in a, in a pack and it's, it's, it's about population and location so it's a comparison of <clears throat> Sheffield population and geographic coordinates and Tokyo's population and so it's just comparisons between the two um, uh, SCC um, so Sissy progressed from being the 2D uh, thing on the front of Emigre um, into sort of having been sort of more of a 3D thing which we did uh, linked in with Wipeout and that. And the reason we made a 3D graphically in the first place was um, I did an interview for, I can't remember if it was for a design magazine, I can't remember which one it was, it was in the UK and they kept asking us about it. Uh, about 3D design and everything because that was kind of the vogue thing um, that 
uh, Paul White and me company were doing, and everything was like 3D this and generated 3D that. And um, so we did this interview just for saying that kind of, you know, we thought like this whole artificial reality and, and 3D was sort of bollocks because we were more interested in, in reality than artificial reality and that making everything appear 3D in 2D kind of for me misses the point because I've got a lot of 3D stuff around me and I quite like the fact that 2D celebrates the, the constraints of working on a flat surface. Um, anyway, so they asked us to do the cover. I mean, uh, they said we really like that sort of sissy we use on emigre. And, and because we were working on Wipeout at the time, we just said to one of the 3D artists there, okay, we'll just do a 3D version of that. So the whole point was, which we thought was really funny, um, was that there's sort of three pages of me ranting on about not being interested in 3D graphics and the Designers Republic would never ever do any 3D graphics and then we gave them a 3D graphic for the cover. Um, what fun we have in Sheffield. Um, anyway, um, but then there was a whole thing of you've got all those sort of bare brick toys and those sort of like injection mold sort of designer toys and everything and there was a, and lots of people kept saying oh you need, why don't you do one and the, uh, someone, um, one of the people that do it, I can't remember, but basically said that Sissy was like the godmother of all the designer toys and that kind of they, you know, that was an inspiration and that we should do one. And we thought, well, we don't really want to do an injection mold toy because everyone else has already done one. So if we're sort of saying that she's the godmother, it's the godmother that turns up late for the party, you know, so we didn't really want to be that. Um, now, I was, I was saying this to uh, Akira in Tokyo one time. He said, why don't you, why don't you make a, 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 I can never say a Hakata doll? And Hakata dolls are those beautiful, uh, sort of hor traditional Japanese kind of sculpted uh, porcelain, uh, uh, Clay dolls, you know, that that kind of have this kind of glow about them, and they're, very, they're all very sort of like beautiful and sort of serene looking and everything. And they they're all made in a place called Hakata, uh, which is on sort of South Island, and um, oh, it's in the south. Anyway, and it's made with Hakata clay, and it's a kind of clay that really only occurs in, in that area. So they make these dolls, and it's become like a it's a real cultural thing in Japan. And we got in contact with this young guy. You have to take, you have to spend seven years to become an accredited Hakata doll maker. Uh, um, you know, it's real sort of you know, it's really important in, in Japanese traditional culture. Anyway, we sort of said we'd quite, we'd quite like to make a, 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 a sissy Hakata doll. Um, so. Is, is, we made 300 of these, and you can only make 300 at a time because the moulds break. They're not. They're, they're kind of. It's just. It might not be exactly 300. You know, it's around 300. And that, then, if you want to make more, you have to make more moulds. Um, and they're all hand painted. So I went. I went over there when they were making them, and I, and literally, so sort of went into like a, a little room, and there's like four little old Japanese ladies, all in traditional gear, just sat there, just chatting away and then so they do one's painting the hair and one's painting the eyes and then they kind of go around you know so it's, it's all really crafted and hand done so we decided to you know obviously that the decision was made you know we made these limitation dolls so this is like uh it references japan because obviously with her sort of manga kind of eyes she's sort of japanese or influenced anyway so uh, that's sissy and still got a baseball bat. Uh, this is this. Uh, this is a this is a picture of a deer with a space helmet on, with the Death Star in the background. <laughs> then we, no, we we were we used to do a lot of we used to do a lot of interiors uh, for clubs. This is for a gate crasher club, and we wanted to do. And it was the idea was that um, it was in a. a, a, a it's in a town in, in the UK, just north of London, called Watford, which is in uh, a county called Hertfordshire, and the, and the heart isn't your heart, it's the heart, which is another name for a deer. 
And the reason it's called Hertfordshire was because it used to be the hunting grounds for the kings like King Henry VIII and all those sorts of people. So we wanted to do something in there. And, and, and part of the interior was, it was all kind of quite modern and industrial. But then we had a, another area that's a kind of VIP area that we wanted to make it look like a, a gentleman's club, you know, sort of wood panels on the walls and, and, and sort of old paintings and things. So we've got these paintings of um, images of, of deer, uh, things like that, and then we thought, you know, we wanted it also to be a bit sort of you know, gate crasher, techno, trance, and all that, and uh, that's dancing. And um, so, so we just put space helmets and space and Star Wars stuff on them. So there's a whole load of these, but this is, I, I just like this one. So these are like, they're not real paintings, obviously, but they're it's about the, you know, the height of this wall, seems to be speak. Uh, S is for Sun Electric, it's a record cover. Um, S is also for Swatch, we did a Swatch watch in 1996. Um, they, they did a series of, of, of Swatch watches based on designers from different cities. Um, and they called us and said, you know, it was the sort of flavour of the month in 1996. So they said, uh, I know we want you to do London. And we were like, yeah, we're not in London then. <laughs> And they said, oh, we'll, we'll just pretend you're in London, because we want you to do it. And, and like, kind of on a global scale, we can't really do a Sheffield watch. And, uh, so then we had to do all this, and then, you know, there's a whole, whole thing, and so we have to do this. We had to say, you know, what, what's your favourite thing in London? And we just said, the train that leaves to Sheffield. <laughs> uh, but anyway, so we did a Swatch watch. T is for Telia. Telia is uh, the telecom company in Sweden, or it was a national. It was a nationalised state telecom company uh, before everything was deregulated and before mobiles. And what happened was they had a whole load of. You know, so they had everything. If you wanted a phone, uh, landline, you went to Telia. Um, then sort of various other companies that came in with the mobile revolution and you had a different service providers and what they were doing effectively was was picking off different sectors of the community so there's one called Convict which I think aimed at you know kids so they had really good deals on texting and all that sort of thing so they could focus on that and another one like I think it's called Europolitan was the sort of the, the, the file of facts on you know, the, the business rates and you know, aspirational and all that kind of crap and you could buy little leather cases for your phones and all that stuff anyway. And so Telia was in a position where like their, their market was being eaten away. So they came up with this idea that, that of, of called Department of the Future and they assured me that kind of to a Swedish, an English speaking Swedish person that Department of the Future didn't sound as shit as it did to, uh, to us English. English speakers, because it sounds just dark. Department of the Future just sounds like, you know, some really bad new romantic album or, you know, or like a bad TV series. But actually the idea behind it was good. But the reason that we got involved originally was through a, an agency called Hollingworth Marotra uh, in, in Stockholm. And they, and, and Teddy was their client. And, and they came to us because they said, oh, you know, you do loads of techno design. And we've got this idea that, that if you do Lots of really intricate stuff like, like this sort of metal on, on, on microchips and, and, and all that sort of thing. That will look really futuristic. And we were like, yeah, but it doesn't know, does it? Because it just looks a bit cheesy. You're like five years too late. And the stuff that you're referencing that we've done is five or six years old. And that's too old in terms of communicating technology. There's no aspiration. It just looks a little bit, you know, like, you know, Dan Dare or something, you know. <clears throat> So anyway, they wouldn't have it, so anyway, we said, we'll said, just go away and do what you think. And so we kind of thought, well, okay, well, what, what could communication, telecommunication be in the future? And we worked out, or, or we decided, that the ultimate form of communication would be telepathy. So we said that if you want to be a department of the future, and you want to kind of project into the future in an aspirational way, then, you, then what you should do is say, well, we're working towards developing uh, uh, a means of people being able to communicate by telepathy. We're not quite there yet, but in the meantime, here's a mobile phone. 
Um, so it's all kind of based on that, but it's all based on that, about, not about technology, but about humans, because communication is between humans, and you know, you don't you pick your phone up and go like, I'm holding a piece of technology to my ear, hello? You know, it's just like you're just calling someone, it's just a means to, for one human to speak to another, or animals if that's what you like. The idea of time in Italia was just that you've got this thing that, this is obviously like an old sort of keyboard and, and it, it animates and all the lights flash, so that the important thing is that when two people, or more, or more than two people, whatever, come together, then actually ideas happen, and it's the ideas and the things that we say and, the, and, and our experiences using technology um, that's more important than microchips and, and whatever's in there because it's like no one's particularly wowed well by the fact that you get a microchip in a phone. Anyway, so we presented this um, and, and I thought I was presenting it to Hollywood Marocha, so I went in. There's some people I didn't know in the you know I hadn't met before in this meeting and I just thought there must be other people, you know, who were who were probably so excited that I'd come, they just want to be part of it, you know. Um, but anyway, I, I, so I presented this, and the, and, the, and the two main guys were going like, no, no, we asked you to do this microchip stuff. And, and, and then this, this woman just said, like, no, hang on, this is, this is exactly what we need. And she was actually kind of the, the client from Telia. So the, the, to cut a long story short, or shorter, um, that the agency got booted off the job, and we got it. So we haven't spoken to the agency again. But, uh, but anyway, so that was Tanya, interesting story. Um, this is uh, this is Yugi's for Unit Editions, which is uh, a, a book publisher a company run by Adrian Shaughnessy and Tony Brook from Spin in London. Um, and this is the cover for a book that another book that we haven't finished. But this is the cover for a, a book that we're doing for Unit Editions. Um, it, it, it's called URTDR, which is like it's a football chant, you know, sort of uh, in England. It's uh, I don't need to talk about that, but anyway, but it's just a, it's just a pun on the fact that it's sort of Sheffield and football and TDR, and and the cover is 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 based on a, a series of stuff of images that we did for a self-initiated project called Fifth Ape, which is all about us being the Fifth Ape and, and stuff like that. Uh, this is U is for Up Over Down Under. Um, this is the exhibition Australia, and it's always like in, in England, you know, Australia is always referred to as Down Under, which for me by definition means that we're Up Over. So the exhibition was Up Over Down Under, um, and and so the, and you know, so literally everything that we did was just based on the gag that. Australians are upside down. To the extent that when I was a kid at school, and most of my friends as well, because you saw you know, Australia's on the bottom, we, we kind of, we were confused as to how people could stand up if they're upside down. You know, when you're like sort of four or five, you used to like, <laughs> And I've still got that, you know, and, and I, I, you know, I know that's not the case now. I've been there and, you know, it's not the case. <laughs> But, but still, there's those sort of things, you know, those ideas you get in your head as a kid, and it's just like, you know it's wrong, it's the first thing that always comes into your head. I always imagine an Australian group sort of working, walking on the surface of a globe upside down. Uh, so that's so basically it was our logo, was just upside down. So, it's the top right way. Uh, v is for Vampire Man, this was like an early DR character. Um, these are just words, instead of, Instead of Christmas cards, we sent all these out in, in the New Year. So there was like a series of four or five <clears throat> that were just really essentially that. W is for Warp, it's a record label. Uh, the, the, the thing about Warp Records was they said we want, they, they wanted to be sort of something that was forward looking and futuristic without the, the sort of cheesy element of being all oh, futuristic, you know, like. And so the idea was that it was. Um, Something that would always be futuristic and would never date. Um, and I'm quite a big sci-fi fan, and I remember uh, I, I've spent far too much of my life watching Star Trek over and over again. Uh, you know Star Trek. Don't you? <laughs> 
Yeah, it's, yeah, 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 right. <laughs> For a minute there. <laughs> it, it was a bit like telling a dog a joke. <laughs> so a dog is about that. <laughs> I love that. I, I, I love that thing where there's a. I don't know if you can hear where there's a. The sort of comedy greetings cards by this cartoonist whose name I can't be bothered to remember. But it was a really funny one because it's like it, it's two images, and it's like uh, this is a slightly off topic. Um, but it's like you know, what humans say to dogs. You know, so a, a name for a dog in, in England, a typical name for a dog in, in England is Fido. So what humans say to dogs is, come on Fido, sit down Fido, come and have your food Fido. No, don't do that Fido. And then the next image is what dogs hear. And it's like, blah, 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 Fido, blah, 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 Fido, blah, 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 blah Fido. Because the only thing you recognise is so. That's the telling a dog a joke. Um, so, the idea of what was we decided to kind of go back to this whole Star Trek thing. The, the, the first series of Star Trek, apart from the trousers tucked into the boots, which kind of, you know, is, is perhaps we've moved on from that as, as a vision of the future. And apart from the fact that, you know, that, that idea of the future is that we'd all be walking around in super clean uh, spaceships and things, as opposed to the shit that we're really kind of, you know, getting ourselves into in the future. Uh, but, it, but it, 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 it has this sense that it is always of the future. It's always futuristic. So we wanted to do something like that. So we kind of went back to sort of Dan Dare and sort of 50s and 60s sci-fi uh, comics and sci-fi thing. Uh, yeah, sci-fi comics. And so for what we, we wanted to create something that kind of looked as if it, it, it's, again, this idea of, of being the future from the past. So there's a thing that we do quite a lot in our work, which, is, which we call fast history, where you you play with you play with images that people already know from the past to to, to try to explain something about a future that you don't already know, uh, and that's what Wipeout. We did a computer game called Wipeout. Exciting. Um, this is. <laughs> But if you know what Wipeout is, there's no point me selling it or telling you about it, and if you don't, then you don't give a fuck anyway, so... <laughs> uh, uh, work by Consume Die, W is for Work by Consume Die, and uh, so this, this came from around the same time as the Flesh Burger, uh, and it's, it was really just about the role of, of the consumer in a consumer game. And really, kind of all, all we have to do, our role, Really, as far as big corporations are concerned, you know, you can, you can put this anywhere you like, but we need to work so we've got money to buy and consume the stuff so we need to buy it again. And then when you get old and you don't have a job and you're not generating any more income, then you might as well fuck off and then let the, the young people come in. And that's really our role as consumers, in, you know, if you want to reduce it down and be cynical. Anyway. So we did this whole thing. Uh, we had this other thing as well, um, which is the Foku Corporation, which is basically the Fuck You Corporation. And um, but we played around with the fact that Ku in Japanese means sort of area, so lots of areas is, is, is a Ku, uh, and, and other things. And also uh, Foku means false in French, uh, kind of transliterated. So. Um, so it's a Foku Corporation, and so the, the logo really is, uh, the second part is cola in Japanese, and uh, the first part are, are, are two Japanese characters that look closest to do a D and an R. So it, it basically we had a whole, we did the whole, this was part of the customised terror exhibition with the Flesh Burger, but it's also something that we've kind of used, and uh, it seemed, people seem to like it every time we, produce a new print or t-shirt, uh, people buy it up really quickly. So it seems, I think it resonates anyway. X is for Richard X. We did this photo shoot. Um, did, 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 did Richard X ever make it as far as Romania? Okay, he, he was, he was, he's a friend of mine and he, and his, sort of thing, he was one of the main people that did this sort of mashup thing of like putting two tracks together. So you know, I suppose it's, it's not totally new now, 2002, but I mean he was one of the first people to do that and people bought his bootlegs because he couldn't release the albums because of the copyrights, so there's loads of bootlegs. 
And then what happened was um, this this band is the band is called Liberty X. And Richard X was in Liberty X, and Liberty X uh, had the were famous because they came second in a TV talent contest. That was their claim to fame. Um, yeah, sort of X Factor, Pop Idol, whatever it was. You know, they they, they came second. Anyway, um, so their management sort of thought we want to try and make them cool. So they then re they got Richard to re-record both tracks off, to, off one of his uh, bootlegs um, and Richard re released it um, legitimately. Uh, and it was a mix of the human leagues being boiled and Chaka Khan's Ain't Nobody. So it's just the two things, it's not like samples, it's almost the two tracks running over each other and there's re record so now it's re-recorded it anyway. So um, and so we did this cover and the idea was so the idea was really um, about how Liberty X had just been sort of plucked from obscurity like working in a factory or in a checkout or whatever. Um, and they're, they're, they're kind of promised fame and fortune in the world by some greasy businessman, record company executive. Um, but, but they're kind of gags, so it's, they're, they're really just sort of, you know, it's not like a band that, that decides they want to, the, the, the band that exists anyway that becomes successful and is then signed. They're just, it's, it's, it's factory manufactured, which is why we shot it in this factory. Except that the factory doesn't look like this. If you look down the middle, right down the middle, you can see that it's it's kind of mirrored. Because on one side there's just a load of windows, and we wanted it to look like a whole sort of thing. So, so this. So the great thing about this is, this, I did this image with a, a Swedish photographer called. Uh, uh, I don't know, he's got a name. I can't remember it. Uh, Carl Johan Paulin, I think. Anyway, he's really good. Um, and the thing, and this, this factory, uh, totally nothing to do with Richard X, but um, I thought it was really interesting, kind of, in that they, when you're in a car and you've got the sort of the, the, the ceiling bit of the car, this isn't the metal on the outside, it's the moulded bit that goes in there. That factory makes every single moulded uh, ceiling for cars manufactured in the UK for any make. Imagine there would be a factory. Uh, that did that. Um, true story. Uh, why is for... Uh, this is another uh, Fuck You Corporation. The interesting thing about the, the Fuck You Corporation is that um, we had an agent in Japan and uh, one, of the, one of the things in, in Japan is that people like us, uh, gaijin, outsiders, foreigners, we could get some like boutique jobs, some interesting little jobs. But you never get the really big work. That's kind of that's kind of kept for Japanese people, which is fair enough, I guess. But um, so I, our agents have said, you know, we need to kind of push it that it's it's okay. You're English, but there's also you're also based in Tokyo, so that you know you've got to they feel like they're kind of getting something uh, from Japan. And he said, and he said, I like that that uh, Foku Corporation idea that you've got because Fuku sounds like Japanese, so people might think that you're a Japanese based thing. So then we start this whole thing, the kind of Designers Republic was the English subsidiary of the Fuku Corporation. And I, and I like the fact that, that they would go into, so he would go into a meeting, and they would do the whole sort of presenting of cards and a very sort of formal Japanese business etiquette protocol. And basically, kind of, he was just so he was going into presenting these things, just sort of basically saying like "fuck you, fuck you, fuck you." <laughs> um, so that whole, so the whole consumerist thing of you know, sort of like you know, kind of buy now, pay later. We just doesn't buy nothing, pay now, fuck you. Um, and the two, and, and this this uh, thing at the top is just is just Japanese for yes and no. So whatever you want me to say, yes. Well, you want to be saying no? Okay, no. Uh, right, finally, so we start with Age of Chance, which is the first thing that we, kind of, first well known, fully formed Design Republic design. And, and this is uh, Zermatt Road, which in, this is the house when I was born, and this is where my mum and dad lived. And um, when we did the, the exhibition in 
uh, Tokyo because you had such a lot of influence, Japanese influence, and done a lot of work. And you know, Tokyo is kind of a second home for Designers Republic. Um, we called the exhibition uh, Designers Republic Come Home to Tokyo. And then uh, a friend of mine was a, uh, I've got lots of friends. A friend of mine was a uh, head of graphics at Croydon College. And Croydon is where I was born, it's, in, it's, it's South London. And, um, and he sort of said, well, you know, I, I know that you were born around here, so you should do Design Robert Comes Home to Croydon. So we did another exhibition called that. And then this was the main, uh, this was the main sort of image for you. Went in, it was a huge, huge kind of, it's almost like half the size of a house. Huge image. And that's, that's um, where I was born, but, but taken today, obviously. Uh, and that's it, so that's, that's really kind of from the beginning to the end, or from the end to the beginning, and that's A to Z. And thank you for staying awake, those of you who have. Thank you very much. <laughs>